Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. Back again today with James Lindsay, this time about his new book, race Marxism. For fun, let's start with this conclusion. Critical race theory is a disaster. Critical race theory is the tip of a 100 year long spear that's being thrust into the side of Western civilization. It is in its simplest terms, race Marxism. That is, it's Marxian theory that rests upon a belief that racism that benefits white people is the fundamental organizing principle of society. Wow. And I think there's so much truth to it, so I really wanted to dig into it. But just a bit of an update. Jane was on the show last April, and he's been successfully building new discourses with podcasts and seminars and books and all sorts of uh, very important material on this whole area of, of theory. Um, and he calls new, new discourses, I love it, a home for the politically homeless, especially those who feel like they've been displaced from their political homes because of the movement sometimes called critical social justice. James, great talking with you again. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks, Bill. I, you know, there's so many places to, to start with this. I don't think most people really have a brief definition of what Marxism itself is. I mean, what's the, what's the frame for this uh, for this uh, for this issue? Well, that's a uh, complicated topic in and of itself, because Marxism is a, you know, Marx wrote a lot of things. He, he actually had a very wide range of views uh, that were all kind of focused around a single thing. So I'm going to give a kind of non-standard answer, but I guess I should pay lip service to the standard answer first, is that Marxism is a particular approach to a socioeconomic theory called communism. So communism was an idea that had been floating around. Socialism was an idea that had been floating around a little bit before that. Uh, very briefly, socialism in general means that the state is somehow going to be responsible for managing the economic affairs of a society. Communism actually means that the, the, the state itself will become, meaning the, the polity, I should say, will become like a commune and the people, therefore, will share responsibility for the economic fate of society, but in a way where it's kind of all for one and one for all. It's going to be communistic in the sense that it will be a commune approach like you might see in you, here in Tennessee. We have this thing that got set up as a commune called the farm, quite famously, where everybody shares resources, everybody's equal, all of these kind of things. And so communism is this idea that you can create a socioeconomic order that is a stateless and classless society where everybody is as equals, everybody shares, and you don't actually need any management because everybody has the same idea that the commune comes first. And that's kind of the most important idea is that the commune, the collective comes ahead of every individual and their needs. So everybody's working for the collective. Marx synthesized a philosophy that we call Marxism that says in essence, that society, in fact, is progressing along a trajectory. He called his, his ideas the scientific study of history, the first, in fact, scientific study of history, and that he had worked out the laws of history and how history progresses in different places and in different times through discrete stages that can be understood, although their boundaries are somewhat fuzzy. Start in primitive communism, move forward, you have kind of a tribal or commune type situation and everybody shares and everybody's equal and there's no private property in particular that, that then eventually people begin to enslave one another and figure out that they can dominate other groups. Private property comes into the picture. People say, this is mine and you're going to work for me. In fact, you are mine. And then we eventually progress into aristocracies where you have feudal estates managed by wealthy landowners and lords and ladies kings and rulers of, of different kinds, and the serfs do all of the labor in exchange for security and uh, prosperity of a limited sort that eventually evolves into a capitalistic program that uh, the serfs are now given their own property. Everybody has access to own private property. 
and they're able to do with their so-called capital what they will, that eventually though, because this is still going to be recognized, just like the previous stages were all recognized as unfair, this will also be recognized as unfair eventually by the people who make the capitalist economy work, who are the workers, the working class, which he called the proletariat when it becomes class conscious and awakened. And they will seize the means of production and establish a worker's state, and they will administer the economy from a dictatorship of the proletariat. And this will be called socialism, where the state now manages the entire economy for everybody and makes sure that the outcomes are fair and equal for everybody, except apparently the socialists who are in charge. And then finally, the contradictions of that state, the need for management will work them their way out as people come to become what Marx called social man or socialist man, depending on how you translate the German. Uh, and that final stage will be the disillusion of the state, the withering away of the state and the classless society where everybody's equal. And you now have this class, you know, the, the tribal communism for a hundred people who are all basically extended family and the way that they share resources will become a global phenomenon in the end with a classless stateless society where the state has withered away and everybody is as perfect equals and everything is distributed according to uh, how people need it and given according to how people have the talent to bring it. So this is classic theory of Marxism. Well, well so, so, how, you know, how'd that work out? Uh, you know, that was yeah, well, that's, theory, but see, that's know, the thing. He is wrote that... almost 200 years later and, you know, Marx was a man, people don't, he wrote on behalf of the so-called worker or for the worker. He'd never been in a factory. He never left the four walls of the uh, the library in London. I mean, this was all sprung out of his own head. Um, yeah, that's right. Talk about that's theory, right. of course. Of course, that leads us into the theory that became critical theory, and then now I guess we've got critical race theory. I mean, that's right. You 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 document so comprehensively sort of the journey from Marx and maybe maybe even before him Rousseau and some of the other fundamental thinkers and and. All these people are academics. They're uh, they're theoreticians. They're, they're none of them are actually been part of the society that they write about or that they would reshape, reshape, reshape. But it seems like the end game for all of them, though, is that they end up in charge. That's right. People like them. So this is where we've paid lip service to what Marxism actually is. That yeah. it's this theory, uh, and this is the intrinsic thing. Now I'm going to shift into something that I actually talk about in the book, Race Marxism. What Marx's theory actually is, is a revolutionary theory. It is a, it is a program that he has written for how do you get from a society where people generally have freedom and have their own private property? How do you go through a revolutionary process to overthrow that society and enter into a new one where people like him are on top and everybody else does the work and shares equally. And they, so basically the idea for Marx is, is, is how do you create a theory that will lead to enough discontent to create a revolution so that people that you claim to be championing the working class for him will seize control well only if they are duly informed well they will seize control of everything and then the people of course who gave them these ideas will then be lifted up as kind of the philosopher kings the new aristocrats of the system and so what marx actually outlined is what's known as a conflict theory of class and he actually talks about this. One of the most common phrases in Marx's writing is class antagonism. Sometimes he writes class conflict, but class antagonism is usually the way that it's written. And what he's trying to do is to explain why the so-called upper class and lower class of society, the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat, are intrinsically in conflict. And so you have a, what Marxism really boils down to then, if we look at it kind of in kind of simple material terms, without getting into kind of Marx's more spiritual views about how things in society work, is that you have a, a stratification a lot. There's some, there's some force in society. In this case, it's class that causes a stratification. So there are layers. There's an upper class, a middle class, a lower class, you know, a completely destitute class, maybe below that. So there's, you think of it like strata in the rocks, you know, the geological layers. And so there's these different layers, strata of society. And he says that those are intrinsically in conflict with one another. This is actually known as conflict theory. And Marx laid out a class conflict theory, class antagonism theory. And the goal is actually to agitate the lower class to try to overthrow the upper class and replace them as the new overlords of society. Well, what you do, though, with your book is you simply drop word race into the place of class where we've got, you know, instead of class 
issues. It's race. And, uh, you know, that's and it's sort of like we've got everything to find in terms of white and everybody else who's not white. And then, of course, they've blurred all the distinction about who's actually white. And that becomes a social construct. I mean, right, right, right. I mean, I've wandered through your uh, your excellent book and it, it but I'm I'm still looking for just sort of that succinct way to say, how do you, how do you, how do you get from Marx to Ibrahim X. Kinti? <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it took the entirety of the 21st or the 20th century to do it. So it's not that it, there is a succinct way to tell the story. And I yeah. hope that the book being just, you know, the, the, really the third and fourth chapters of the book as kind of a sort of microcosm of the book, tell that story in a, kind of succinct way it's it's a difficult book i'm not going to to hedge around that it's 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 truly a difficult book but it's difficult history um but th i can give you kind of the historical answer where you you mentioned the critical theory that then leads into the critical race theory that then gets us this ibram kendi character uh but the answer essentially works out to that that marx was wrong but the marxists didn't give up and this is the very simple answer so if you understand that marxism is a conflict theory that uses class. And then you understand, as the Marxists of the 20th century came to figure out that using class doesn't work, what happens is actually, as you agitate for labor reforms, you don't, or when you even activate the workers to organize, they do not agitate for a revolution of society where they become the dictators. They actually agitate for reforms. And as those reforms happen, and there are the words of, of, say, Max Horkheimer, a critical theorist who have coined the term critical theory, or in the words of Herbert Marcuse, the, the kind of chief critical theorist of the 20th century, writing in these both are quotes from the 1960s. They said Marx believed that, and this is quoting Horkheimer or paraphrasing Horkheimer, Marx believed that capitalism would immiserate the working class, but it doesn't. It allows them to build a better life. And then if we switch from Horkheimer to Marcuse, Marcuse says, and in fact, it is a good life. This is, that's actually his exact words. It is a good life. Capitalism, advanced capitalism, he calls it, delivers the goods. And so he says that the working class becomes a stabilizing or stabilized phenomenon. They get their working reforms. They get better pay. They become a, a burgeoning middle class. Wealth inequality goes down. People actually can get a home, they can build a life worth living, and they're actually content with this. And Marcuse says, but they, this takes away their revolutionary spirit. They don't see the utopia that's possible any longer, and they become a conservative and counter-revolutionary force. So he says we have to, and this is exactly out of the essay on liberation that Marcuse wrote in 1969, he says we have to find a new working class. In other words, we have to find a new rev revolutionary reservoir of energy. And he says of vital, vital needs for revolution. And he says, where do we find it? And his exact words, and I always have to preface it with this because of what his exact words are, are the ghetto population, wow. the black radicals. So he's looking at black nationalism. He's looking at the black liberation army. He's looking at the black Panthers. And he says, these guys have a revolutionary spirit. These guys are actually teaming up with liberation fronts around the world, which were communist liberation fronts. Liberation is a communist project for the 20th century. And that derives straight from Marx, who said he was liberating people from class divisions. Uh, and so you have the, these, these populations became the new reservoir. And I keep telling people that the, the metaphor I, I don't put in the book, I didn't think of it till the other uh, few weeks ago, uh, is that you can think that, that Marxism as a revolutionary conflict theory was running up an interstate of class division. As you can think of it like, you know, I live here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We have I-40 intersects I-75. So it's running up north up 75. And it gets to the 1960s. That's where Knoxville is. It gets to the 1960s and there's a huge exit ramp. And now it starts running on identity politics instead because the working class stabilized and they had to find that energy somewhere else. And that, to be a little more fair and a little more comprehensive and make it a little more clear, Marcuse says the ghetto populations, the black population, and then he goes on and says the feminists, the sexual minorities, all of the uh, societal outcasts and the unemployed those people are going to be the revolutionary base and they're going to be radicalized and brought into Marxist theory by a student population that can be radicalized in the university. So, so if I could turn this a bit towards maybe simplifying it, Marx as an economic theory clearly didn't work because capitalism 
delivered the goods in economic terms. Material well-being uh, clearly improved. A couple billion people have been lifted out of poverty in the last 150, 200 years, maybe more than that. So it didn't work to explain economic outcomes, and people were happy with that system. So instead, you had to find some other grievance groups. People were the disaffected, even though you had material well-being, socially, culturally, they were outcast and downtrodden as they felt. And so the most obvious group were the group that was already, um, you know, up in arms in the 60s, uh, you know, the, the black community. And so he seized upon that as the, as the nexus for the next uh, next next stage in, in what you call the off ramp. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, basically, the argument, if you if you want to take it in kind of the way that Marxists would phrase the argument is they would say, as Marcuse said, capitalism is working, it's delivering the goods. And then the next sentence would be because they always have to, as they say, expose the contradictions, but it's not delivering the goods for everybody. And so here are these groups, these racial minority groups, sexual minority groups, et cetera, feminists, women that are not getting the goods delivered to them, at least not in equal measure. And therefore, they become, as you said, that grievance group, and that can be stoked with Marxist theory. If you understand, though, that Marx, if you stop thinking of Marxism as an economic theory and think of Marxism as a conflict theory across a line of social stratification, it's, in other words, you generalize what Marxism uh, uh, represents, then it's very easy to see how you can swap out what the stratifier is. The stratifier might be class, money, wealth. Or it could be race, or it could think, be sex, I, or gender. I think, I think that's a really important notion because if we think about this, and you know, my background is in finance, business, Wall Street. If you think about it in economic terms, is there, it's the, we had the free market people and the socialists, and that was the that was the conflict. That's really not the conflict. The culture the cultural conflict is where the action is, and that's where we're seeing it playing out with critical race theory. That's um, right. And you know your, your your definition though you have a couple of them here. Uh, critical race theory is calling everything you want to control racist until finally it's under your control, and then you get into the Marxian conflict theory of race. And then the third one is this is this is the one that I think everybody ought to know cold, which is they believe racism is created by white people for white people's benefit. And it is the fundamental organizing principle of society, and that I think is what is the is the thing, and I think is unbelievably pernicious. Because if you if you accept that definition, you're forever guilty of being white or not being white, or when only the privileged people under this new system uh, would would be not white. I mean, I'm, correct. I'm, That's right. So I'm you know, a... this you know they 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 take billions of words to get to the point that they want us out and they want to be in charge. I mean, that's what Lenin basically said. He said a thousand pages of theory or a thousand lines of theory. I don't remember the exact quote for every idea that exists or something like that. And yeah. so, you know, they, they do, they, they write tomes upon tome. Their, 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 their academic output is unbelievable. Partly, thank you for re thank you for reading them. So we don't have to. Partly because it's really easy to make it, right? It's right. it's it's really easy to write this stuff, um, but yeah, that's that's basically the gist. So if you are a racial minority who is successful, because it's success that they're after, it's success that they hate, they would say that you are upholding white supremacy, or that you are buying into the white system, or that you're acting white, or that you're seeking white reward, or that you placed yourself as white adjacent so that you'll be accepted so uh, into the propertied class of society. It's the same Marxist idea that there's the propertied class and the unpropertied class, and they are intrinsically in conflict with one another. The property for Marx was called capital, bourgeois property, as he, as he refers to it in the uh, Communist Manifesto he wrote in 1847 and 8. Um, he calls in, in the second chapter, he's very clear. He says that you have this thing called capital, and that is bourgeois private property. And he says communism can be summarized in a single sentence, the abolition of bourgeois private property. In fact, he says just the abolition of private property, but at the end of a paragraph explaining, he only means bourgeois property. The name for bourgeois property for Marx is capital. The name for bourgeois property for critical race theorists, as documented in a paper that gives away the punchline, uh, in 1993, Cheryl Harris, a critical race theorist, wrote a very long, almost 90-something pages law review article titled Whiteness as 
property. And so they characterized whiteness as bourgeois property. And in fact, she says that it is a reproduction of bourgeois property in the paper, in the footnotes at least. And so what you have is a reproduction of the idea that there is a propertied class that either has capital or it has cultural capital and whiteness. And then you have other people, maybe within the working class or the racial minority class, who are scrabbling to get access to that private property, whereas the people who control it have the fundamental right to exclude them from it, generating the conflict. Well, well, well they go further. They also talk about whiteness as a social construct. Yes, and that, and that's that, right. Uh, White, white people invented whiteness so that only they could be white and only they could control that class. And so it's sort of this, this, this endless inside loop where they're in, you know, they're in and you're out. If you do believe white people uh, invented the notion of whiteness, which, uh, which was a new idea to me. Yeah, that's exactly correct. So by moving it into the realm of social constructivism at, and outside of the realm of material reality, uh, they actually have made it even more unfalsifiable than Marxism. It, it, it's absolutely um, kind of arbitrary. If you read in a book, Critical Race Theory and Introduction, a lot of people, I think this is particularly funny and I bring it up a lot, but they talk about whiteness in this regard, that it's a social construction that was created by um, primarily Anglo-Saxon people from England, but also whatever the groups of people that, you know, that would have been in like Germany, et cetera, to classify themselves. But then especially with the Anglo-Saxons, Anglo you had these other groups emigrating to America. They were coming into America. And um, these people were Irish, they were German, they were Italian, et cetera, coming over in waves. And in the book, in Critical Race Theory and Introduction, which is by a founding member of Critical Race Theory, Richard Delgado, um, they characterize, they say, well, when Irish people and Germans and uh, Italians came to the United States, they were not classified as white. They're classified as Irish or German or Italian, and they were excluded. And racial epithets were used that are, would be familiar to being used for black people. And other racial epithets were used to exclude them from whiteness. And then whiteness expanded. And they, in fact, document that the Democratic Party made a deal with the Irish and the German communities in the cities and said, if you vote Democratic, we will classify you as white. And uh, so wait, wait, wait. this is, 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 is that is that something do they have any evidence? Do they have the tapes for that? Do they have they don't have the tapes? No, it's, Did it's, they just make that up. I don't know if they made it up. I don't know if it's true, but they they chronicle that the Democratic Party said, we'll let you be white if you vote for us. And. <laughs> There's a book that was, for, this is a very frightening book that I think pe more people need to be aware of and need to read from, I think, 98 or thereabouts by a woman named Karen Brodkin called How Jews Became White Folks. Oh and God. she character, it, oh, it reproduces Nazi ideology virtually perfectly. She, she claims that through the 1950s that the Jews, particularly in the cities of the United States, position themselves as white. They threw other racial minorities under the, under the bus so that they could gain access to whiteness. And then they became the cultural trendsetters of whiteness and rose to the top of white society and became the people by taking over things like Hollywood in particular and media, the people who, who, who define white culture. And so you have this whole hoarding of resources, you know, worming their way into privilege they don't deserve and hoarding of resources narrative running through in how Jews became white folks. But this is the idea not to linger on that horrific reproduction of, of Nazi ideology. Um, but this is the idea is that whiteness is a category that was created by white people and is expandable according to their whims. The only people, according to critical race theory, who can never become white are blacks because whiteness is imbued with anti-blackness intrinsically. So my <laughs> well i you, you know that just to jump forward to, to a couple of years ago we had the black history museum smithsonian had an exhibition on whiteness and mm -hmm. it was it was extraordinary they categorized all these all these attributes that they considered white and in a, in a really negative way and it was mainly what i would call bourgeois virtue and mm -hmm a lot of the things that are the success factors and their success factors not for quote whites their success factor for asians for italians for mexicans for people from costa rica it's basically a set of attributes um, that allow people personal agency and to get on in the world and you know to not declare yourself a victim is one of the uh is one of the whiteness factors so 
if you turn that around and you say, well, I don't want to be the, I don't want to be white, then you end up with this culture, which is only a culture of victims. Or am That's I, right. You know, That's right. And they call that, they call that race consciousness or racial <laughs> consciousness, which is a critical consciousness of race in the same sense that the critical theorists or critical Marxists same thing as Marx, same thing as refer Marx. to, yeah, as a critical consciousness, as an extension of class consciousness for Marx. Now you knew, use a word that I, Define Gnosticism. That's a really interesting mm. thing. It goes all the way back, but it seems like what we've got is kind of a Gnostic movement now. That's what it is. Yeah. Um, so uh, Gnosticism is a very peculiar uh, take on how the world is structured. It, it's it predates Marxism. You know, it's arguably the thing that's recorded in Genesis with the snake. Uh, the, the idea with Gnosticism is, as kind of Martin Heidegger put it, uh, that we've been flung into the world against our wishes, whether that's because our parents procreated and made us or whether it's because, you know, the deity formed us, you know, knew us before we were born and cast our spirit into the world. But we were flung into this world and the world is actually a gigantic, to kind of paraphrase off of Michel Foucault, uh, the postmodern philosopher, the world is a gigantic prison. And we, we created or, or we hold up this entity, God, as though he is the deity. But in fact, what he is, is the jailer that holds us trapped in this world. But that if we can obtain the special knowledge, to put it kind of in biblical metaphor, if we can eat from the, the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge itself and gain knowledge of good and evil for ourselves, then we can be as God is and we can know right from wrong. And we don't need to uh, follow God's orders any longer. And we will in fact see that those orders were kept as a kind of a list of rules for the prison yard rather than rules that would help us to flourish so that we can actually rise out of the condition we've been flung into and enter into a new higher state of being where we're truly liberated from that which imprisons us. That's the basic idea of Gnosticism. Well well, and yeah, but it's also if you're a Gnostic, only you can know the the, the inner truth. The, the Correct. Truth. That there and is nobody, some and nobody pathway. else can, and that's what they've accorded themselves in this in this theory. Correct. Which is only they can know um, blackness, and anybody else is not allowed to uh, or can Correct. possibly understand or see or talk about it. That's right. That's the special knowledge. So they what they're outlining, say, in critical race theory through what they call positional standpoint epistemology is that, uh, that what they're outlining is how you, to use metaphorical language, how you take the bite of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. So for all of these theories from Marx going forward, Marx thought it was scientific. He had the true scientific study, but what it really boils down to is that oppression grants you special knowledge, understanding that you've been flung into an oppressive prison by experiencing it yourself or by having been enlightened by the theory in particular to interpret what you've experienced, that gives you the special knowledge that allows you to see the world as it really is and to see uh, whether it's God, whether it's societal structures, whether it's the, the leadership of the society, whether it's the, the hierarchy of society as the jailer. Well, the black, these theorists, and I'm not going to say black, just these theorists of, of critical race theory treat people like Jason Whitlock and Candace Owens, who were black conservatives, they're no longer black. Correct. And now, how do they throw them out of uh, Gnostic uh, heaven? So the idea is, so you, you'll hear that they talk about structural racism, right? And that's when I give that definition as the fundamental organizing principle of society for critical race theory. Structural racism or systemic racism, which by the way, are basically the same thing interpreted in two different ways. Uh, is the reason. So what they believe is in a doctrine called structural determinism. So the structure of society, which is caused by the social relations between the superstructure and the infrastructure in Marx's terms, or the base, there's a, there's a set for Marx. Let me, let me actually back up and do it from Marx. He said that there's a superstructure. That's where the capitalists and bourgeoisie are. And they create these ideologies that justify their supremacy over the base. that does all the productive work, draws the material resources out of nature and turns them into something of value that the superstructure then redistributes uh, for their own benefit. And what he says is this creates a series of a set of social relations and the social relations are the way that that co class conflict works out amongst or between the two. This is what he called dialectical materialism, is that these two are in dialectical opposition over materialistic 
economically materialistic concerns. And so this creates a structure for society between the infrastructure and the superstructure is the structure. And so Marx actually believed in a concept called material determinism, that your material conditions determine your character. This has shifted since structuralism didn't exist in Marx's day. It was invented by French theorists, French Marxist theorists, in the early part of the 20th century, maybe even the late 19th century. I'd have to double check the history on that. But structuralist thought has shifted this more into the cultural realm into the linguistic realm, into the realm of knowledge and how we produce knowledge and ideas. Uh, and, and what happens is they've shifted into this belief called structural determinism. So where you are in the structure of society with all of the different stratifying forces, whether it's class, race, sex, gender, et cetera, that structure determines your character. The structure determines how you see the world, what you can see in the world. Marx said that the social relations limit your range of subjectivity. They limit who you are, what you're able to perceive in the world, and that's how it determines your character. Structural determinism is the same. So what you have is that people who have the awakened consciousness in all of these Marxist theories, so a racial consciousness according to critical race theory, people who have that awakened can see the true nature of reality, and it gives them what critical race theory calls a unique voice of color that comes from properly understanding, in other words, critical race theory interpretation understanding, of their position as a racially subordinated class. So people like Candace Owens or people like uh, Larry Elder who ran for governor in California and was called by the LA Times, the black face of white supremacy for doing so as a conservative. Uh, People like Kanye West who put on a MAGA hat a few years ago and said, I think for myself and Tana Hizzy Coates came out, writer for the Atlantic came out a few days later and said, he's no longer black. Dave Chappelle makes jokes about trans people in his most recent big special, and the article that came out about him says that he made those jokes from his position of white privilege, by which they meant his his ample wealth uh, that he had, had earned by appealing to white people who paid him lots of money for his specials. Um, all those people are not expressing their voice of color the way that oppression by race should shape it. So therefore, they are not acting authentically Black. And I've given a number of gross examples, but I think the most clear example comes from the Democratic representative from Massachusetts, Ayanna Presley. And she said, I think this was getting toward the fall. I'd have to check the date of when she said this, after uh, fall of 2020, after the BLM riots. And she said, uh, we don't need any more Black faces who don't want to be Black voices. We don't want any more brown faces who don't want to be brown voices. And so what she's saying is that there is, in fact, an awakened or a racially Gnostic view, if we want to dip into what we just talked about, of what it means to be black or brown in a white supremacist America. And that if you have that consciousness, that race consciousness, then you will speak about race in a particular way. And if you don't do that, then what you're actually doing is upholding the white supremacist system, so, probably either in false consciousness or for cynical self-serving motives. So for those of us that would call cynical self-serving motives personal agency and, per- and see personal agency as a key to human flourishing, to personal happiness, to uh, you know, uh, you know under- understanding where you are in the world and your relationship with God, those of us who believe in personal agency have no place in this world. And if that is if that is the key to happiness, then there's a reason why these people are all so miserable. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I mean, this is a really unhappy crew. I mean, there's there's nothing that, that will uh, will ever satisfy them with that uh, with that worldview. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. Um, I mean, there's I mean, a number of different things we could say, but this is why they are so vigorously angry at people like Candace Owens, who they relentlessly label a grifter. Um, they believe that people like Candace are uh, not speaking the truth that they actually know. So rather than just seeing them as, you know, poor saps who are ignorant and who have been brainwashed by society to think that this is just the way it is, they actually see people like her as traitors. And so they treat them with all of the resentment that traitors are, are given. Um, we, you and I could, I think you and I could talk about this for a couple of days, but let, I, we got a l- limited amount of time. Let me go to something I wanted to get at, because this is not just some abstract thing that's in, in academia. This has obviously jumped the walls of academia, and it permeates every institution of, in America. And uh, uh, Heather Higgins, or Heather, Heather uh, McDonald's written uh, 
very interesting, uh, interestingly, about uh, art museums and uh, symphony orchestras, and we obviously this permeates university, but it's it, it seems to have seeped into a lot of these places where these 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 terrible white people want to be liberal and they want to treat people as uh, you know as equal, and they do not want to have any sense of discrimination. So they're trying to bring the black community into these cultural institutions, which have typically been white, and yet. What they're missing is that critical race theory is not liberal and Correct. it doesn't believe in equality and it doesn't believe in merit and it doesn't believe in 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 the sort of things you think of as liberal. It it's it's just the opposite. Do you wanna yeah. wanna unpack that a little bit for me? I mean it explicitly from if we turn to critical race theory and introduction, which I remarked upon earlier, which was again written by Richard Delgado with his partner. I think it's Gene Stefanczyk. Um, obviously, that's a name that unless you've heard it said, it's not quite clear whether it's Gene or John. Um, but uh, anyways, uh, in the, the very first paragraph of Critical Race Theory and Introduction, they explicitly throw out the liberal order. They say, and this is pretty close, I can quote it pretty close from memory at this point, they say, unlike traditional approaches to civil rights, which embrace incrementalism, and step-by-step -step progress, critical race theory uh, calls into question the very foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory, uh, legal reasoning, enlightenment rationalism, and the neutral principles of constitutional law. In the next paragraph, they say that the reason that they do this is because the point is not to understand society, but to change it, which is a direct paraphrasing that's of their, Marx. That's their praxis. That is their praxis. That's right. Yeah. That's why Kimberly Crenshaw, who's credited with naming critical race theory and is often named as the founder of critical race theory, very famously and very many times has said critical race theory is not a noun, it's a verb. It is something that you do. It's very important to understand that, that uh, and I, I re actually regret that I did not include that quote in the book in chapter five where it belongs. And I should go. We're going to, we're going to talk about your next book too. So we'll, we'll, well yeah, <laughs> we'll have a couple coming. Um, so at any rate, uh, it, it is not liberal. It is an explicitly anti-liberal. Um, I happen to know in the first edition of the book on page 23, Delgado writes that critical race theorists, he actually says crits to be clear to the quote, but that was a shorthand for critical race theories, theorists at the time are highly suspicious of another liberal name, mainstay, namely rights. And he says in the next paragraph after that, after that, that rights are, are, are believed to be alienating. And of course, alienation is the key Marxist theory. And why is that? Because if I utter a racial epithet or whatever, or if I say something racially tinged or toned or whatever, then I can say, well, I have a right to free speech. So rights are themselves alienating. What, and, and let's, can you blow up, can you expand on rights? I mean, is this, are these natural rights? Are these rights that come from government? Are they rights that come from something else? I mean, what do they mean when they don't believe in rights? I mean, this book, to be clear, was written on the high school level uh, intentionally. <laughs> well, and it has classroom exercises at the end of each chapter. I thought they or, were meant to be not understood. Yeah, well, I mean, this book was, <laughs> this book is, I, I think this is a book that everybody who wants to understand critical race theory should read, uh, critical race theory and introduction. It's 190 pages, like a four hour read. It's not a difficult read. In fact, we're it's only, at the high we're school only level. plugging race theory today, <laughs> <laughs> but at any which rate, we can, which we can find on Amazon. What they probably mean is something akin to what we would think of as as uh, natural rights, or in particular, you know, where we read, which is natural rights theory uh, from the Declaration of Independence, that human beings are all men are, men are created equal and endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, including the life to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Or if you go to John Locke, preceding Jefferson to property as the third. Um, and so it is probably that conception that they are attacking, seeing as equality theory, legal reasoning, neutral principles of constitutional law and enlightenment and rationalism are the things that they specifically name that they're attacking. And so the idea of equality theory obviously echoes all men are created equal. That is equality theory, as a matter of fact. And then um, the idea that, that, that men would have rights that somehow precede the state. In fact, this is why they are so fond of the word privilege. Is it not? 
because they want to replace rights that precede the state, that the state exists to help citizens secure for themselves against potential tyranny. They want to replace that with privileges granted by the state. So if everybody's thinking in terms of who has what privileges, it's easier to shift into a privilege granted state away from a rights endowed state. So it's more than likely natural rights theory, but I want to be fair. I don't specifically know what Delgado means by the word rights, but the context suggests that. Well, I try to dig into some of these writings. I've got a, I got interested in deconstruction, gosh, almost 25, 30 years ago when it was in its early, early versions and have been struck though by how impenetrable most of this writing is and how circular and you know this definition leads to the the it's all circular as far as i can tell and it's all what's the word sol solipsistic or something yes like that. yes it's both it's both and um how big is this cottage industry it's no longer a cottage industry oh my gosh how many critical race theorists are we dealing with and how many books and how how <sighs> pervasive is this I mean, it's probably easier actually to track money than it is to track, uh, yeah, let's track money, total numbers of people there. But I mean, to, to kind of answer the question directly, there are probably, you know, like anything, there's, there's the kind of rock stars of the theory. And then there are the kind of, you know, everyday professors doing it. There are probably, if I were to put a guess on it anywhere, and I would say it's in the order of magnitude of, of 5,000 or so critical race mm -hmm. theorists actually dedicated and kind of fully imbued. And these are almost all going to be in think tanks and universities, maybe more than that, maybe 10 or 30,000. Um, the money though is easy to track because you can look at how much money is being spent on the so-called diversity, equity, and inclusion industry, which is com almost completely informed now, almost completely captured by critical race theory thought. And that, even in 2013, was already approaching a $10 billion a year industry. And so that is a ballooned. And last year, I don't even know what the number would be, but it would it, astronomical amounts of money, billions upon billions upon well, billions well, of dollars. The diversity of equity and inclusion uh, head at uh, University of Michigan or Michigan State is making $450,000 a year. That's typical, yeah. To hire four to five of them for the course of a five-year plan is usually a five to six if, million dollar budget. But if there's one big takeaway I would like people to get is this. This is not about affirmative action. This is not about including people in a way that makes it a level playing field. This is just the opposite. This is, That's right. This is, this is, this is tipping the order completely, and, and it's outcome-driven. It's not opportunity driven. It's this is the outcome we want to seek. So when you think about this nice little diversity officer in your university, you got to think about that in terms of what critical race theory really wants. That's right. So how would you qualify as diverse being an expert in diversity as well? You have your unique voice of color. <laughs> so you have you've taken on the theory. You so I, don't I, I represent. Don't have, I don't have a job opportunity as a diversity officer. Well, you could actually <laughs> if you were spouting the theory and apologizing for your whiteness constantly. Okay. However, if you had the awake, like Larry Elder doesn't. Larry Elder doesn't have a black voice, as Ayanna Presley phrased it. So he does not represent. If he were on a panel, he doesn't represent black because he's not speaking from a black voice, and so he is not diversity. So only the people who say the things they believe should be said represent diversity. So your diverse, your diversity pushes are actually commissar pushes. They're people who spout the theory, who enforce the theory within the organization. Inclusion is actually kind of the other side of that coin. Um, what inclusion is actually about is making sure people who have the critical perspective feel included and therefore don't feel excluded. So if they are, you know, you have to be of your diverse perspective and have the unique voice of color, but then if something challenges that, they can say, I don't feel like I'm included in this discussion. I don't feel like you're giving my ideas the proper due. I don't feel like I belong. Belonging is another one of the words that they use. It's the same as inclusion plus positive affirmation. You have to clap for your commissar as well as make sure that they don't feel offended. And what this does in practice on a light level is it weaponizes people who can take offense, which is completely subjective. Anybody can whine and say that they don't feel included. And then if they in, are a member of a so-called protected class, they get treated differently. If you said you don't feel included, they'd say, shut up, white man, we don't care uh, because it's 
you, you are, you already have your privilege, so you have to deal with it. But if say a, a black or a Hispanic or an Asian or some other racial minority, as, as it said, would say that they don't feel included, like they feel excluded or made uncomfortable or homosexual or a trans or any of these things, then all of a sudden the whole mechanism has to come into action. Whatever made them feel not included or excluded has to be removed whether that's words, in other words, so censorship, whether it's ideas, so more censorship or what Marcuse called pre-censorship, or even whether it's the presence of an individual, say that you've said something offensive and they no longer like you there. So then it becomes an actual physical purge. So diversity, equity, and inclusion programs by the, if you, if they have adopted critical race theory as their engine or critical theories of identity as their engine are the establishment of a commissariat. Equity is the project. Equity is the goal. Equity is what they're shooting for. And what is equity? Equity is adjusting share so that groups are made equal on the outcome level. And that's what you're, you were pointing at. So what you're seeing is the impl- DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion programs, are the installation of a Soviet commissary in your organization. The diversity, equity, inclusion officers, their goal is to create socialism, uh, equal outcomes by, so, by, so- by group. And their mechanism is through enforcing diversity and inclusion, which diversity has to mean people who have their unique voices of structurally determined, whatever identity factor, color, sexuality, et cetera. So this is like inserting a political officer into a a military unit or a business or something Mm -hmm. like that, or having a Chinese communist party be on the board of your Chinese company. This is, Mm -hmm. this is putting a political officer in your midst. That's correct. And they're very important at Coca-Cola, as we know, at Pepsi-Cola, mm-hmm. at Disney, at all the Nike. I mean, the, these are these are these are these are you're saying these are political officers that are determining not just the narrow personnel policies, but everything that that organization's about. Correct. Wow, it's a disaster, wow. and they've infiltrated literally everything. So, what do we what do we want to? I want everybody to buy your book and. You've got some wonderful right, some wonderful phrases in here. One of them is, uh, this is a theory that it's about as broad in what it touches as a great lake and about as deep as a mud puddle. That's true. <laughs> because when you keep coming around to it, it's all about, you have power, I want it, and we're going to redefine everything so that you have to give it to me, and there's no other outcome except we reverse our power positions. It's you know, it's, it's a little bit like Animal Farm, or I, you know, I'm, I'm simplifying, but it. So, let's sum up here. What, what, what do you want people to take away from your book? I want people to understand that what we are actually going through in the West, throughout the West, and critical race theory is the racial component of this, is a cultural revolution, exactly like what proceeded in China, 1966 through 1976 under Mao Zedong. The only difference is that there's no Mao. There's no one central planner who is, you know, taking over the whole power grab. It's diffuse. It's a cultural phenomenon rather than an individual phenomenon. And it is empowering a set of ideas, whether somebody will rise up and in, to the top of this pile and declare themselves in charge of it or not is unclear. Probably not by the way it's being uh, implemented, which is largely through kind of investment portfolio metrics, these ESG things we all hear about environmental social governance. Guess where? Guess what the social part is? Is <laughs> critical oh, yeah. race theory is right in the middle of that. Uh, and so, what I want people to understand though is that that we are in a cultural revolution. It is a communist cultural revolution, and it is using identity politics instead of class. Race Marxism is obviously the racial component of the identity politics. And the goal of writing the book was to, at the beginning, explain what critical race theory is in kind of an unvarnished way. I say in the introduction that the reason I wrote the book is because there are only two types of criticisms, one that's very naive, uh, and then which is often, you know, somebody opposing it, and then one that is written by cheerleaders from within. And those are extraordinarily varnished interpretations. So the first two chapters of the book are designed to take the varnish off, explain what critical race theory is and what it believes. The next two chapters of the book are meant to explain what where critical race theory comes from. So you can understand, in fact, that it is Marxism. That has just been reinvented through trying to solve the problem of how do we get to revolution? The working class failed us. This failed us. You know, 
this and different aspects of Marx's ideas weren't right. What do we do? How do we change it? How do we still get to revolution? And then the last two chapters are how does it work? That's people tell me that's their favorite chapter, by the way, the most enlightening chapter five. And the sixth chapter is, um, uh, what can we do about it? And that, of course, is the most speculative, because if anybody knew what to do about it, it wouldn't be happening because it's very stupid and very divisive and very ugly and very uh, uncomfortable. Um, but it's also very pernicious and very uh, difficult to discern. So my hope is that if people can discern critical race theory where it is and understand what it is, then that resistance can grow in you know the necessary organic way that will will actually be able to push this back out of our society and maintain liberty. I'm with you. Um, it's an important book. I, th I think it's, I almost see it as a kind of reference book. It's not something you sit down and you read straight through necessarily. No, when it's you hard. come into different chapters and as something comes up, you've got some place to go to to find out. You're saying, where'd this come from? Well, you've, James, you've got it figured, you've got it explained in, in the book. Uh, James Lindsay, author of, uh, uh, race Marxism, which is a book I highly recommend. Uh, and I also, it's not just the book, it's what everything James doing with uh, critical discourses in his, in his work and his education. And I think we all need to support him and because we need to support a free society and our liberties. And James is all about that. And I, I admire what you're doing. <laughs> As I joke, thank you for reading all this stuff so we don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Well, I put a lot of quotes in there so you can read some of it. But it's true. It's all you. Hey, I don't have to. I could, anyway. Thank you. Um, this is this is Bill Walton show. I've been here with James Lindsay, uh, 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 intellectual extraordinaire. And, and uh, I'd say also has a lot of praxis in him, which is making his theory uh, uh, come about. And uh, we'll have you back again you know, soon, I hope, to talk some more about this. As I said, this could take a while to, to really get deeply into it. So anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We're on all the major podcast platforms, uh, CPAC Now, For America, Apple, uh, Spotify, uh, the whole the whole, the whole list of uh, places you can find uh, uh, content. We're there and hope you listen and hope you'll come back soon. Thanks. Bye. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? Click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over 100 episodes. You can also learn more about our guests on our Interesting People page. And send us your comments. We read everyone and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, we'll keep you informed about what's true, what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining.